Okay, good evening, everyone. It's great to see you all tonight um, and to see so many people who are here for our workshop. Uh, my name is Brian Cofrancesco. I'm the Leadership Development Coordinator for the New England and Bermuda District and a member of the Kiwanis Club of Meriden. It's my honor to welcome you to tonight's presentation. Um, those of you who are here on Zoom and those who are watching live on Facebook. Um, our workshop tonight is about club culture and it's kicking off our May series of workshops all focused on membership. This is the 21st session in our virtual workshop series. Um, and I know some of you have been with us from the start. Thank you so much. Uh, we hope you're enjoying these sessions and that you'll continue to encourage others in your club to join us every Wednesday at seven o'clock p.m. And if any of your members are not receiving our emails, be sure to drop us a line at education at newenglandkiwanis.org and we will look into it and to share the registration link with them. So I am going to drop that in the chat for you right now. That's where you can email us and where you can find the registration. A reminder that all of our workshops have the potential to count as interclubs in your monthly secretary's report. So if your club has enough members in attendance at this workshop, you get to report an interclub with each individual club that's in attendance. So to help everyone determine the number of interclubs they can report, we ask that all attendees send a quick message in the chat where you saw my message and share your name and your club. And if your club is eligible, you can do one of three things to track attendance. First, you can write down all of the names of the clubs who are announced in the chat. Second, you can click the ellipses, the dot, dot, dot next to the chat to, and click save chat so you can review the club names later. Or third, you can visit our Google Drive of resources for a list of clubs that were represented at each workshop, including tonight. And that is compiled by our Education Committee's Interclub Liaison, David Griffin. And you can find a link to that in our weekly confirmation email, the one that you received this morning, just scroll down to the bottom. Before we start tonight's workshop, some housekeeping. Please mute yourself to assure an uninterrupted presentation. If you are new to Zoom, the mute is in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, and a line through the microphone will indicate that you are muted. You can click or tap that microphone to put yourself on mute. If you are, uh, you, sorry, you are welcome to keep your camera on. Uh, we always enjoy seeing everyone, but that is not required if you feel more comfortable keeping it off. If you have questions for tonight's presenter, please post them in the chat or send them directly to me as a message. If you're watching on Facebook, we also invite you to post questions. You can do so on the stream and we'll grab them for our Q&A at the end. Tonight's presentation will be one hour and you will be able to find the recording of it on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. So with that, we are ready to get started. To kick off our May is Membership Month workshops, we are very fortunate to have Chris Martz, the Director of Global Membership and Education at Kiwanis International in Indianapolis. Chris is here to talk to us about the topic of club culture. Chris describes club culture as, quote, the way things are done in your community without a constant need to explain it, end quote. A high performing club culture allows a group of people to produce great results almost on autopilot. And our education team felt it is important to start the conversation on membership with a workshop on ensuring you have a good, good club culture as a foundation. So we are so lucky to have Chris with us tonight. He's the head of all membership and all education for all of Kiwanis. So uh, that's a really big person to have with us. Um, and I've known Chris for many years since my time as an SLP. So it's wonderful to have him. So please give a warm New England and Bermuda welcome to Chris Marks. Thank you so much, Brian. It is so great to be here. And um, I see a lot of familiar faces. I enjoyed my time as an area director with uh, New England and Bermuda. So I am very happy to be with you uh, tonight. Um, as Brian said, we're gonna talk a little bit about culture, um, but I like Zoom meetings to be a little bit interactive. So that means you're gonna have to participate a little bit, but it only means that you're gonna have to type um, so I'm going to ask um, a question. Um, first of all, it's been a very long 14 months. We all know that. Think about how many Zoom meetings you have been on in the past 14 months. Um, think how many of you didn't even know what Zoom was 14 months ago. So in the chat box, 
I want you to think about your own Kiwanis battery. If you, if you had a battery inside of you that was just Kiwanis, um, what part of your Kiwanis battery is not fully charged right now? Just start chat, uh, chatting some ideas of, you know, what's going to really spark that charge um, as things get back to normal? Um, let's see some good ideas come in. Energy, community service in person, yes. As you guys are chatting, um, I've asked this question many, many times of, of people and um, service is generally the, the number one thing that comes up. I also just saw hugs. Um, that is so important. Um, you know, we, if we see people, um, I'll never forget, I uh, went to a, a Kiwanis Club meeting um, after things kind of opened up and immediately um, it was sort of like two of us just stopped in midair with this big hug. We didn't know what to do. Do we continue? Do we stop? Um, but yes, getting back to all of those things, um, you know, traveling, things like that, um, just working with kids. I mean, we may not even be able to go back into schools yet for another year. Um, there are lots of things that, that still need to um, be thought through. So think about uh, your Kiwanis battery. And the, the reason I, I bring this up is I've been talking to a lot of clubs about returning to normal. And I want you to think about an actual car battery. And when you think about a dead car battery, you know that you cannot charge it immediately. You know, there's a whole series of steps that you need to do. First of all, you need to connect the cables and you have to start the working car. And you have to let the working car run for a little while to charge the dead car. And then you try starting the dead car and sometimes it doesn't start. Sometimes you have to try again. You have to let it charge a little bit more. That is essentially what Qantas is going to be like. As we get back into a normal routine, getting back to working with our SLPs, getting back to working with our community partners, um, our, our fundraisers, everything. Everything's gonna take a little extra effort and a little extra charging. So I just want to use that analogy um, because I don't want you to get discouraged if things don't work the first time back. Um, you may be dealing with new people. Um, I use the, um, um, example with the Kiwanis board um, last week when they were in town that when I go back as the Builders Club advisor in, in the middle school that I'm the advisor to, no one in that middle school will know what Builders Club is because it's a two-year school. We are going to start from ground zero on building a new Builders Club. Um, so there are a lot of things that, that we just have to think about uh, in this, uh, this new world going forward. Um, so we have another chat question. When you think of the word culture, what do you think of? When you think of the word culture, what do you think of? Traditions, good. History. A lot of traditions coming in. Diversity, food, customs, diversity. Things that aren't written down, but everyone knows exactly. Atmosphere. So these are all good things. Memories, love, that feeling inside, uh, how a club treats its members and prospective members. This is all stuff we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so many times when we start talking about club culture, we go immediately um, to the diversity aspect. And we are gonna talk about some of that tonight, but really, and Brian read uh, the description that I used for, for the workshop, and I'm gonna um, highlight just a couple things here. The way things are done in your community without a constant need to explain it. A good Kiwanis club is known for something in the community. 
So if I walk up to a complete stranger in a grocery store and say, what does Kiwanis do in your community? They know, they know what Kiwanis is. And just like um, someone mentioned in the chat, potential members, you don't have to do a lot of explaining. Potential members know what you do. They know how you do it. Um, they know why the community needs them. They know why the community needs Kiwanis. And they know immediately where they can fit in to the whole club process. So those are the things that we're going to, to talk about uh, tonight. So I love this image because there is really no better time than now to rethink everything we do. Um, we've gone through, um, hopefully some of you are getting back to meeting, uh, hybrid meetings, in-person, uh, all in-person. That's great. Some of you may not be meeting yet, um, and that's fine. The time will come. But this is a great opportunity as we're thinking about emerging from the pandemic to uh, think about how we can change things for the better. Um, how we can make a good transition back to in-person um, or better yet hybrid meetings um, because you need to remember that when your club goes back to meeting in person, not everyone is going to feel comfortable coming back. So what, um, what can you do for them? Can you offer them a hybrid approach? Um, I've been talking to a couple clubs that have had porch parties throughout the, the pandemic. And they will um, have a meeting at someone's um, porch that has good Wi-Fi. Uh, they have a good um, laptop with a, a camera on it. And um, people who meet in person can be there. Um, people who are um, virtual can also join in. That's what we're talking about, making uh, the necessary um, accommodations for those people who can't always be at your meetings. Um, you want to make your meetings um, worth returning to. Um, we need to rethink everything, be creative, um, be cautious of returning to the old way. You know, one of the things I realized about three months ago was had we known what Zoom fatigue was 14 months ago, we would have completely talked to Kiwanis clubs about a different approach to virtual meetings. Most Kiwanis clubs had an hour long meeting. And what did they do when they went on to the virtual world? They had an hour long meeting. And um, I've really discovered that a lot of clubs that have taken their hour long meetings and dropped them to 30 or 40 minutes are having better attendance. Um, people are engaged and it all goes back to that whole Zoom fatigue. And if you don't know what Zoom fatigue is, just Google it. There's some great things out there. Um, two things that are, um, two um, nuggets of information that are, are kind of, kind of um, interesting. The Nielsen ratings, um, realized that during the height of the pandemic, our screen time usage spiked to 13 hours a day for the average person. 13 hours a day on a computer, a mobile device, a TV, uh, every screen device. The other interesting thing is that in from, from March 2020 to March 2021, our consumption of online material doubled. How we get our news, how we get all of our information doubled in just 12 months. That is so interesting, I believe. So really just rethinking everything, being creative. Um, and it's not just your meetings, it's being creative with your service projects, your fundraisers, social gatherings. All of those things need to be hybrid. Um, going forward. And we're going to talk a little bit about that um, um, later. So some things about culture. And um, I just have some bullet points. I'm going to talk through some, some ideas. Some of these may really resonate with you and you're like, that would really work with our club. That is something that we need to think about. 
I'm also going to give you probably, you know, 12, 15 different ideas um, throughout this workshop. Please know you cannot do all of them. Choose one or two that, is, that will work best for your club and really implement those. But here are some things that you really should think about. You know, first of all, does your club near your community? And that in itself could just be, you know, population numbers. Um, when you look at demographics of, of your community, do the demographics of your community um, mirror that of your Kiwanis Club? It's just something to think about. Um, are your community partners represented? One of the things that I've really learned during this pandemic of, of speaking to so many clubs um, is that they have great relationships with a lot of community partners, but none of those community partners are really members of the Kiwanis Club. Get them to be members. I think that that is so key. You know, on the Qantas International level, we have made a, a large push of, you know, we have partnerships with the Boys and Girls Club. Have the Boys and Girls Club director as a partner. The same applies on the local aspect. All those local community partnerships that you have, get someone from the, those organizations to be a member of your club. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about is your club inclusive? And I wanted to make it kind of humorous um, because we all know that our clubs are some, uh, somewhat inclusive, but there are some times that people feel a little strange about going to a club. Um, you know, there are things that happen, like if your club does a prayer, someone may be a little turned off by the prayer. Someone may be turned off by uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. But just think about little things. So meals. When we return to having meals, um, do you ever have a um, vegetarian come to your club and you're a meat and potatoes uh, type of club? You know, just thinking about those type of things. Or the other thing is, are meals required? And that becomes an issue as well. Um, so thinking about, you know, are you including everyone who, who wants to uh, attend? Um, that's also something great to think about for people who can't attend like a noon meeting, but they want to be a member of your club. Um, I know so many Qantas clubs that do not discount dues. Um, they include their meal cost and they don't discount um, for someone who can't attend at noon, but wants to be part of all the service projects. So that's a turnoff. Um, again, going um, emerging out of the pandemic, are your meetings hybrid? because um, that's going to be really key. Because again, if you return just to in-person meetings, you may start losing some people again. Um, the schedule, you know, does it, does it work for people? We're going to talk about satellite groups in a, in a moment. Um, oh, it's the next bullet point, sorry. Satellite groups. This is a great way to get more people involved in your club. And the way a um, satellite member works of your club is um, you have a parent organization and you may have a group of, let's say eight to 10 people who um, maybe they're a little younger or maybe they have a vested interest in a neighboring community, but they wanna do work in that neighboring community in the name of Kiwanis, but they don't have enough people to start a Kiwanis club or they really just don't want to um, do everything that a Kiwanis Club needs to do, but they want to be Kiwanis members. They can join the parent organization and do service on their own. Um, that is a great concept. Um, now, I know that you're probably, at, those of you who have never heard of satellite members, you probably have a lot of questions. There are resources online on the Kiwanis.org um, website, but it's a great way to um, add members to your club that, again, Maybe they're a little younger, or maybe they just have a different interest in, in the club. The other thing about um, culture and just a great activity that I think um, are just something to do is a roster analysis worksheet. And if you go online and you um, type roster analysis 
and maybe Elise can put the link in um, to on the Zoom chat. Um, but it's a great brainstorming sheet, and it's just a list of occupations. So like accountants, um, bakers, it just lists a whole bunch of occupations, and you can just go through and um, think about, you know, who are the veterinarians in your club? Um, I brought up plumber the other day because it just, it, it just was the first thing that came to my mind. And someone said, why would a plumber join Kiwanis? And I was like, I don't know, let's talk about it. Um, come to find out they did a Habitat for Humanity project. And I was like, guess what? You need a plumber. Um, so, you know, everyone is welcome at Kiwanis. So this is a great brainstorming sheet just to think about occupations and getting your club members, um, you know, thinking about different people in the community who could be invited. So some other things about um, culture. You know, clubs have to be friendly. They have to be inviting. Um, they provide an enjoyable experience. Uh, and then they generate positive energy. That, those things all attract new members. New members are not going to want to come into a boring meeting. They want to be uh, in a place that is upbeat, that's very positive. They want to be part of service projects um, that are enjoyable, again, that are upbeat, um, that really make an impact in the community. And so, you know, that is, that is so key. Um, you know, first impressions are huge. Um, you know, when, when you walk into, and I'm going to use my own at club as an example, there are some days um, when we have a guest and we have a person who does humor every um, meeting. And every once in a while when we have a guest, I sort of hold my breath what the joke of the day is going to be. And I shouldn't have to do that um, because that could really bring about a bad first impression. Um, but, you know, obviously when you see a guest, you know, walk into the door, um, you know, you're going to greet them. You, everything's going to be very, everyone's going to be very friendly um, and explaining what Kiwanis is all about and everything that they do. So again, remember first impressions. Um, you know, there are all kinds of studies out there about the first 60 seconds when people um, meet someone or the first 30 seconds, you know, how important um, those first few seconds are. So someone said memories in the chat um, uh, and, and just, you know, um, the, the hugs, the friendship, all part of culture. Very, very true. Each club is a treasure trove. Um, all the members have stories, experiences. They all have skills um, to share. The other thing that we have learned through this pandemic is we've probably learned more about our club members than we ever wanted to know. And um, one of the first clubs that I um, talked to um, because they were having a great Zoom experience, um, I said, what are you doing for your speakers? And they said, well, we started the first month doing our traditional speakers. And then um, the president told me, he's like, so we're having a meeting one day and one of the um, the ladies in our club was asked, um, where did you get that painting behind you? Because we are all checking out everyone's kitchens, everyone's living rooms. That's all part of Zoom. We're all judging people um, by what is in their background. Um, and that's supposed to be a joke. I'm not really judging all of you. Um, but when you think about it, you know, you are, you're looking at everything. Um, and so that she was asked about the painting. She's like, I painted it. No one in the club knew that she was a painter. So this started a whole series of Zoom meetings for their club. And they found something that everyone did that was that most people didn't know about or was very interesting. One of their members uh, set up his computer uh, in his garage um, woodworking shop and did a whole demonstration about making a birdhouse and different woodworking skills, just really cool things that are happening. Continue that, figure out a way to continue um, learning about your members. That's so important. 
And then the other thing I, I want you to think about, and I think I've got these, yep, I've got these out of order. Um, joining versus belonging. Um, do your members join a club? or do they belong to a club? And here are some examples that um, I have. So joining is what a member does, but belonging is how a member feels. And I know some of you put that in uh, the chat when we talked about culture. Uh, joining is definitely just a transaction. You join something. But the whole idea of belonging is an experience. Kiwanis is an experience. At some point, you're gonna have that aha moment, uh, that Kiwanis moment, and that's when you realize that you are um, part of something much bigger than your own community. Uh, so belonging is also emotional. I think about all the emotions that, that you've had in your um, Kiwanis experience. Um, belonging lasts longer than just joining. Uh, and hopefully it's forever. Um, and we don't want Kiwanis to be a three or four year experience. Um, we want it to be a lifelong experience. Um, so I'm going to go back to um, this slide, back up one. So think about this. What if Kiwanis, what if we had Kiwanis for everyone? And in a hundred mile radius, we had different Kiwanis experiences. So here's just an example I, I threw up. And um, so Let's say you have a hundred mile radius and it's close to a, a metropolitan downtown area. And that was the first club that started. That's the oldest club. It's the largest club. Downtown clubs are usually larger clubs. They usually have more money. They've been around longer. But as part of that downtown club, they have two satellite groups. They have a satellite group, like I talked about, in a neighboring suburb, just 10 people who came together and said, hey, we really would like to do service in this community five miles down the road. Can we do that? Sure, no problem. And then they also have a literacy um, satellite. And this is just a group of people, let's say it's 15 people who are really excited about reading to children, um, promoting literacy, and that is their mission. That is what those 15 people are doing. All of their service projects are just based on literacy. So you've got this club and two satellites. Then we also have a young professionals club, not too far away, um, where you know basically we're, we're talking about the under 40 um, membership. And then you know maybe 20, 30 miles away, we have a suburb that has started a 321 club. And the 321 club concept is um, basically three hours of service, two hours of social, and one hour of meeting each month. Uh, just a, a different concept for a, a club um, meeting. And that suburb has also started a satellite. And that group of 12 people, let's say, just focused on food insecurity in the community. They may have a um, small issue in, in um, their school system. They're, they're doing a lot of you know, food pantry work, blessings in a backpack, those type of, of projects. But that group of people just focused on that project. And then you have this group of people who really cannot commit to Kiwanis Club meetings. They want to do service. They can't commit to club meetings because of work or travel or whatever, but they're a member of an e-club that is you know, basically neighboring people, um, but they meet virtually. So you've got these, all these concepts for Kiwanis. So this is all about the Kiwanis culture, that Kiwanis can be welcoming to anyone. We just need to find the right place for that person. You know, I have often joked that um, when I was a Lieutenant Governor in the Indy Metro area, I brought in a lot of Kiwanians. I did not bring in one Kiwanian to my club. Um, but everyone I met who was excited about Kiwanis, they just fit better in another club. And that's what you need to do. It is not necessarily about bringing people into your own club. It's about bringing people in to Kiwanis in general. 
So let's talk about who in your club. Um, talk about, uh, think about those people who are not engaged in any of your activities. Think about those people who just don't seem happy all the time. Um, you know, have conversations with them. Um, you know, what do you want out of your Kiwanis experience? You know, that is so important to ask. You know, we've, um, many of you have heard about the membership satisfaction survey and, and hopefully at least every other year you're doing some type of membership satisfaction survey to find out what your members want and need out of their experience. Um, the key is not just doing the survey, but implementing change. Um, and sometimes that change is really difficult. Um, just as an example, um, several years ago, the first Qantas Club I was a part of um, did a membership um, satisfaction survey. And what we found out was we were doing too many projects and they were all over the city. Um, and it was true, like we did projects downtown on the north side, east side, like all over the place. And we actually committed to um, doing the next year service within a five to seven mile radius of where we met so that we were known for just doing service in that area. And that was very difficult to let go of some of our service projects. Now we picked up some new service projects, um, which is always awesome. And make sure that when you bring in new people that you're asking them what they wanna be part of. And if you don't have that experience for them, find out um, how you can get that experience for them. Kiwanis clubs can always have new service projects. Um, who is not in your club, who should be? And again, we go back to all those things I talked about before, the roster analysis, um, the other things that are kind of just brainstorming, but think about who's not in your club. And I always like this question, but if you were having a Qantas club meeting, like who would be an unexpected surprise um, to just walk into your meeting and say, I'd like to join Kiwanis. Um, and if everyone in your club kind of writes down that person, that's sort of your, your goal person. Um, like, wow, that would be really awesome if all these people would join Kiwanis. Now, we want all awesome people. Everyone who joins Kiwanis is, is awesome. But just that, you know, and maybe in your club, it, it's the mayor. You know, maybe it's the police chief. And maybe you just think if they're going to walk in to your club and ask to join, that's going to be totally awesome. Um, but the other thing is, um, you know, walking up to a complete stranger and saying, why have you not joined Kiwanis? And just see what their answer is. A lot of people are going to say, what's well, Kiwanis? And then you have an opportunity to talk to them. Um, but a lot of people will say, yeah, I know Kiwanis, but I just don't have time. Um, and, you know, those are all questions that, that can be uh, very well, you know, a good conversation can ha be had with those types of um, questions. So think about what your club is known for. Um, some of you probably have great signature service projects, and that really should be what your club is known for. When people say Kiwanis in your community, they know what you stand for. Um, you know, the one, the one issue that Kiwanis does have, and it's a slight identity issue, is that we don't have that one thing. Um, yes, we've had global um, campaigns for children throughout the years, IDD project, Eliminate project, we've had others. Um, but when you talk about other organizations, immediately glasses come up or polio come up. Those are the things that people know. Um, even if they know nothing else about the organization, they know those two things. So it is so important that people know what you do in your community. And it's okay for the Kiwanis Club 20 miles down the road to be known for something else. That's what Kiwanis is all about. Uh, and that's what makes our identity very, very special. Um, if your club is not known for anything, what should it be known for? And that's a really important question to ask. And then, you know, you have to ask yourself, is there something our 
Qantas Club is known for that we shouldn't really be known for? And I think that that's just a question that you need to ask yourself just to, to realize um, uh, or to analyze, are there any negative aspects um, to our club? So you guys all know our vision statement. Um, you know, Qantas will be a positive influence in communities worldwide so that one day all children will wake up in communities that believe in them, nurture them, and provide them provide the support they need to thrive. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about vision because I think that, that fits into to culture a little bit as well. So how do we do this? Um, this is a little activity um, that you can easily do um, with your club. This does not take a worksheet to do. Uh, this is basically um, you know, three questions that you ask people, um, but you ask people these questions. How do you believe in children? How do you nurture children? How do you support children? And then as a club, you start talking about how does our club believe in children? How does our club nurture children? How does our club support children? And then what you start doing is looking to see if, if those match and where are the outliers? What members nurture children in a way that your club doesn't? Are there opportunities for new service projects there? And again, that just starts the conversation um, for um, the club. It's a great exercise to do. Um, and I will, um, I will share my um, slide deck um, with Brian so that um, the participants have this. Um, so in case you didn't catch it, writing down notes, and you can easily do this. But again, it's just comparing what a member wants versus what your club does and any potential changes that you might want um, to make. So I want you to think about this. Kids need Kiwanis. We had this well before the pandemic. Kids needed Kiwanis before the pandemic. Kids needed, need Kiwanis even more during the pandemic, but kids are going to need Kiwanis even more after the pandemic. And I think that that is so key because as we emerge from this pandemic, kids are going to need us even more. Um, so I think that the, that is where you're going to have to focus some of your um, service projects and hopefully they're new service projects. So some of you probably know the book, Start With Why by um, Simon Sinek. Um, one year when I was Lieutenant Governor, this was our entire theme is um, we focused on why. Um, so we know what we do, and we, hopefully we understand why we do it, but Qantas, Qantas clubs really need to examine how they provide service and how they impact the community. And an easy question is, what do we do differently than Rotary or Optimist or Lions? Um, and if you do similar projects to them, can you change or what sets you apart? Um, so do you tweak the project so that, you know, you basically have one segment of, of that project that makes you a little different? Um, so just thinking about that. Um, you know, these type of things, I talked about the membership satisfaction survey and, um, you know, looking at the, the vision of, of Qantas and, and, and how um, members want to do things versus how a club does things, um, thinking about diff different service opportunities, um, you know, tweaking those type of things. What is your club's comfort zone and what's going to disrupt it? For some of you who are very traditional Qantas clubs, and there's nothing wrong with that at all, but this can be a huge disruptor in the Kiwanis world. But I want you to know that you have the permission, you have permission to try something new. 321 clubs came about because clubs wanted something new. And we saw this group of, of clubs that were trying new things. Single emphasis clubs are our next big thing coming down. Um, we are opening clubs that are just literacy clubs. We are opening clubs that are only focused on food insecurities in their communities. Um, any single emphasis that, that um, focuses on children 
can be open. In California, Nevada, Hawaii, they just opened a club that is focused on safety. Uh, their biggest thing is gun safety. And you know, we are doing a lot of different things, um, but a single emphasis club is an amazing opportunity to get in front of the community in a different aspect. So I want you to think about this. Everything that your club does needs to be engaging, it needs to be a hybrid, and it needs to be membership driven. We, we know the engaging part, we know the uh, membership driven part, but I wanna talk about the hybrid part just a little bit. Um, because again, emerging from the pandemic, everything that we do is going to be hybrid. I mentioned service and fundraising earlier. I'm gonna talk about uh, fundraising for just a moment. That's going to be very key. Um, increasing our um, social media footprint on our clubs, very, very important. Um, everything you do should be on your Facebook pages, on your social media um, pages, they should be shared. Even though you know about that event, you share it so, um, so people in other um, parts of the community or other parts of the world see it, especially fundraisers. Um, you know, it is, it's a great opportunity for a friend of yours who lives in California um, to donate to a fundraiser because they know that you're so passionate about Kiwanis. Um, so it may be a fundraiser that um, you traditionally do in person, but you have a virtual component. Um, many of you have seen, um, because you might be a club secretary and you received a mailing, um, what are called the then and now cards. But if you go to quants.org slash then and now, you see an interactive PowerPoint slide that you can use with your clubs. And basically it is um, a series of prompts of how a club did something pre-pandemic and how a club is thinking about doing it post-pandemic. And there are probably, I think there are 20, 25 different things um, that you can walk through. And it's a great activity for your club um, to kind of think through those, um, you know, brainstorm on some activities and then see what um, the, um, the recommended um, opportunity is. So just uh, three, uh, two more quick sides here. Um, you know, these are a lot of questions that you can ask yourselves, uh, just increasing the culture of in your community. You know, what if your club had a signature service project? We've talked about that. What if the whole world knew our name? What if you didn't have to say, um, you know, if someone says, you know, what is Kiwanis? Um, you have to explain it all the time. What if we didn't have to do that? Um, you know, what if we nurtured our future leaders through our service leadership programs? Um, you know, what if every kid in our community had a Kiwanis mentor? These are all things, these are all visionary things that we need to think about. So I'm gonna leave you with this last slide. Why is this so important? Bringing you back to the vision statement. Why is this so important? Because we believe in kids, we nurture kids and we support kids. Those things in the next 10 years will not change in the vision statement. What will change about believing in kids, nurturing kids and supporting kids is how we do it. And I think that um, Kiwanis clubs across the world can be on the cutting edge of thinking of creative ways to believe, nurture and support our kids. And most importantly, um, just increasing everything that you do in your community, expanding, you know, being culturally aware of your community, who you bring into your club, and most importantly, having fun doing it. So thank you very much. Brian. That was awesome, Chris. You've got so many ideas and tips and suggestions in a very digestible way, all in one presentation. So we've had a lot of questions come in. So I'm gonna just jump right in. Um, the first one I think talked about like when you were saying, asking people why they joined Kiwanis or why they haven't joined Kiwanis, what brought you to Kiwanis? Oh, so um, I was one of those people. Um, first of all, I was known as the longest guest in my Kiwanis club um, because I just kept showing up. But 
to get me there was very difficult. Um, coworker of mine, every Tuesday, he would say, he'd come down and he was like, Chris, would you like to do my Kiwanis Club? No, Andy, I can't go to your Kiwanis Club. I don't have enough time. That was my thing. Um, and I'm one of these people that if I'm going to do something, it has to be all in. And um, so my first Kiwanis Club I went to, the speaker didn't show up. Now, I have a whole workshop for club officers about when your speaker doesn't show up because that's so important that you have plan B. So the club president learned 30 minutes before the club meeting on her way over. She stopped at uh, CVS, whatever, and got disposable cameras. Yes, it was the time when we had disposable cameras. And we had to go on a scavenger hunt. I was now trapped in a car with four strangers. And it was the most terrifying experience for me because I'm, I'm an introvert, but it was the best experience for me. I learned so much about Kiwanis in that one hour of time. We did so much stuff. One of the things we had to do was stop and buy gas for a random person and take pictures of us doing it. We were doing service and having fun. It was just a great experience. So that's what brought me to Kiwanis. That's a great story. <laughs> All right, our next question. Um, does Boys and Girls Club or any of Kiwanis International's other partner organizations tell their local franchises about Kiwanis and encourage them to be members? That is a huge issue. Um, I would say that um, our communication out is really good. Uh, our partner communication with, with their local entities is not so good. Um, and I'm not blaming anyone on that, but that is why we have toolkits online. So there's a Boys and Girls Club toolkit. Um, uh, there are other toolkits for our partners of how to talk to local entities about um, Kiwanis and, and joining. Wonderful. Um, and those toolkits are all uh, just on the Kiwanis.org website? Yes. Uh, yes, they are. Okay. So if you have more questions, please continue to drop them in the chat. I'm checking there as well as if anybody is watching with us on Facebook. Our next question, um, and I feel like this might be the case for some of our clubs, uh, several other clubs tonight. You mentioned clubs that say a prayer or do the Pledge of Allegiance. Despite my own views, the prayer and pledge make me feel uncomfortable because I know they can make our club not seem inclusive. How can I broach that subject with my club? Um, so I, I can really only um, speak to my experience and I've had other people who once I've told them about this, they're like, I love this. Um, if your club is diverse, your prayer needs to be diverse. And what I mean is it doesn't have to be you know, a, a generic prayer. Half of my club is Jewish. And um, we have the sign up sheet for invocation. And when it goes around, um, all of our Jewish members are looking at their calendars and they're figuring out when the Jewish holidays are. And they sign up for that week of invocation. That week, they do a, a Jewish prayer. And they also do an educational moment of why that holiday is so important to them. So whatever religions that you have or whatever people want to, to believe, if that invocation to someone uh, is a poem and you know, they want to do that, let them. Um, I, think the, I think the great way to approach that is not to um, walk into a Kiwanis club and say, hey, Brian, will you lead the invocation this, this week? Have it prepared out. And that's what I like about my club is that we do have that sign up sheet. So first of all, you know when you're going to do it, but you can also plan out if there are events um, or, or holidays that you want to work around. Um, but I also think that that educational moment is, is really, really important. I have not heard it put that way. That's a really good tip. So our next question, what's the best way to make a good impression when someone comes to your club for the first time? <laughs> Um, um, first of all, um, being very welcoming. Um, my um, first Kiwanis Club um, had a policy 
that if someone showed up at the door and we had a lot of people just show up, we had people who would bring guests, but we were in an office complex. And so some people would just show up and um, someone would come and grab that person and welcome them. Um, we were in charge of introducing that person. We never put them on the spot to introduce them, uh, the, introduce themselves. Um, we did that for them. Um, and then that person also sat next to them because when you are sitting at Kiwanis Club, if you're a stranger, the things that are said that make no sense, when someone starts talking about a bug, well, if I have a guest sitting next to me, I can lean over and say, hey, bug stands for bring up grades or action club is our club for adults with disabilities. I can whisper in that person's ear and that is so helpful and it doesn't necessarily interrupt um, the club meeting, um, but it keeps that conversation and it keeps that person very engaged into what is going on and, and all the crazy things that um, they're, they're crazy to guess. They're not crazy to us. They're just our life. Um, but we have to be able to explain them. Uh, so just, yes, being welcoming, um, definitely engaging uh, and, and teaching them as you go along that, that first meeting. Uh, you're gonna, if you do happy dollars, like what is this? People are throwing dollars. Like, what does this mean? Um, so I would always give a happy dollar for the guest I was introducing, you know, and, and just kind of then explain why we do it and what we do with that money. Well, I think this question kind of aligns with, I think what the other, per, with the last person's question was too, and you kind of touched on it. Our club can be clicky, same tables, talking to the same people, et cetera. Any tips for breaking that habit or at least bringing it up? Well, my current Qantas club has the boys table and the girls table. Um, and I, every once in a while, will break it. Um, but it, it's a very difficult thing to do in, in some Kiwanis clubs. Um, and uh, I always, um, in my um, prospective member workshop, I talk about, you know, the member who comes in and sets in Joe's seat that he set in for 20 years and everyone gasps, but they don't know what to do. Uh, and they just pray that Joe's not coming that week. Um, <laughs> you know, those are all things that happen. Um, your club needs to understand that they, they, they do need to be a little bit flexible. And, and yes, um, a lot of clubs are um, clickish. I think that mixing things up are, is a great way um, to do it. We used to, when we met in an office complex, uh, the tables had wheels on them. So they were real easy to move around. So we changed the shape of the room um, a lot, which was very helpful. So sometimes it'd be in use, sometimes it'd be in classroom style. You know, that, that is extremely helpful, helpful if you can uh, change things up. Um, also, if you, let's say if you meet and you only have tables of four, um, you know, you may just decide um, or think that you should announce like, we sit in the same seats of four. Um, and Brian may sit with his wife at the club meet. Why is Brian sitting with his wife all the time? Mix it up. He sees her at home. Um, sit with someone else. You know, have some fun. Um, don't just, don't make it a task that they have to do. Make it a game, make it exciting, get people up. I think my wife likes the break from me, but I totally get what you're talking about. <laughs> So um, do you have tips for clubs that don't currently prioritize member retention, but want to start? Um, <clears throat> you know, you know, member retention is, is it's an interesting topic because um, so many times we learn about a member who is leaving the club at the end of the year. Now they may have made that decision months ago but the whole process of them leaving is to, if they're gonna leave, they need to get off the roster so they're not billed. So they're not making an issue out of it, but if Elise is the club secretary and I'm leaving the club, all I have to do is tell Elise that I'm not going to be a member next year. Now, Elise as the club secretary knows that she has one job, update the roster. 
what Elisa's job really should be is, wait a minute, why do you think, why do I think that Chris is leaving? Brian sponsored Chris. I need to talk to Brian. Does Brian even know that Chris is thinking about leaving the club? Those are conversations that need to have happen. Now, again, so many times we, we talk about the September purge, you know, that last week that people are, are leaving Kiwanis. Um, but you also know those people who have not been fully engaged. If someone, you know, is that, Maybe two years ago, they attended everything, and now they're down to 50% of um, the events that they attend. Find out why. Start having those conversations. Um, I think that that is the most important thing of, of member retention, is being very proactive in that piece. Um, and I think that that will help tremendously. And again, if there is something for that member to do in the club, um, Again, that, that is important. Um, so when new members join, getting them engaged immediately. That's great. I love that answer because I've heard, you know, a lot of clubs that kind of do one of two things. One, either, okay, they resigned, that's it. Others who, okay, our job is now to make them stay. And then everybody mm -hmm. bombards them, but no one really thinks about, well, what's the reason? and taking action on that's such a good point and fix it i mean if it's something that's fixable work on it absolutely such a good point um we're coming up on our hour but we've got some really good questions that i'm hoping we can still get through if that's okay yeah um, that's why the we have a couple that have come up um on transitioning cultures um the first one is our club is transitioning in its culture i believe in it and i'm sticking through but I don't know how I can recruit people to see it through with me. Do you have any tips on how to recruit people to a transitioning club? I don't want to see our club fold. So um, Brian and I um, were talking about this before um, the meeting actually started. So my Kiwanis club, the reason I joined the, the uh, my current Kiwanis club um, is I didn't want to see it fold. Um, David Letterman's mom, and for those of you who don't know, David Letterman was a, a late night um, television host of Late Night with David Letterman um, was a member of our club. We are sitting on her foundation. Um, she has left us lots of money. Um, I, our club, like I said, is, is extremely elderly. Um, my goal is to um, start with satellite members. We had a good group of satellite members and again, young people their lives change very quickly. Um, just things happen. We lost a lot of those satellite members. We'll rebuild after the pandemic. Um, but I think sticking with things is very, very important. Um, communities do transition, whether it's it's age, um, whether you know, just communities and their demographics changing. But really. Um, finding out what the community needs and who are the movers and the shakers in that community who can, can help you out. And if you can be real candid with people as to why you want them to join, um, that is very important. Um, you know, you may have a real reason. It may not necessarily be service um, and not that it's a political reason or, or whatever, um, but we opened a club in Waukegan, um, Wisconsin, and I actually recruited the former club president of Waukegan Rotary. Now, she was very excited about Kiwanis, and she was going to stay in Rotary, but she wanted to join. Um, but the reason that she, and she brought this up, she wanted to join because she knew that the Hispanic population needed to join this club. And she wanted to be part of that. So she knew um, that we needed to get in to that population and she was going to make that happen. And I think that sometimes you just have to tag that person. We actually got a comment in the chat from Dave. Met David Letterman's mom at a convention in the 90s, got her autographed cookbook. Yes, 
Oh my goodness, there it is. <laughs> So uh, our next question, similar, um, I'm in a very traditional club. How can I transition our traditions that are no longer working? Do you recommend a multi-year plan? Yes, definitely. You cannot change everything um, in one year. And it may have to be baby steps. Again, we go back to that membership satisfaction survey or just being really honest, um, you know, what asking members what they don't like about their club. I always bring up this example. I always ask people, how many of you sing? And then my next follow-up question is, how many of you should sing? Because most of the time it's not good. Um, and I've actually been on Zoom meetings where people are trying to sing and that's even worse. Um, but you know, that's just one example. And then what are you singing? Um, you know, it may be a patriotic song. It may not, you know, apply to everyone or, um, so just thinking about those type of things. But if there if there's something that you realize that is really not of, of benefit to your club, um, you know, how can you do it differently? Or uh, how can you just transition to, uh, you know, you know, how we do things? And I think that this whole Zoom experience is is probably um, going to change the way a lot of clubs meet when they go back to being in person. So yes, don't do it all at once. Just like I said earlier in this, this session, you can't do all 15 or 20 ideas that I gave you. Choose one or two that will really work for your club. That's excellent, excellent advice. Um, we have two questions left. Um, okay. We are a traditional club and are down to just a few members who do everything and are all feeling burned out. Where should we start? What tips do you have? Um, so burnout is, is a very common problem. Um, so for nine years, um, I was the, I'm just going to tell a little story. I was the um, um, chair of the Easter egg hunt and no one would step up to do it. So finally on year 10, I lied to my club. I said, I'm not going to be in town on Easter. And I only did it because no one was going to let the Easter egg hunt, you know, not happen. So someone stepped up and said, well, I'll do it this year. And uh, the great thing about that is they did things a little differently. And they add, actually added some, some different, some fun things into the, the egg hunt. Um, so I think that you know, that is really key um, to really stepping back and thinking about what you want to do. Why, you know, are you just doing things because you've always done them or you're just in that, you know, it's the annual motion uh, of, of the Qantas calendar and this is what we do. Um, and sometimes you have to make those hard decisions. What things should we get rid of because we do not have um, enough members, enough hands to do the service. Um, what things have changed? You know, if you have an event that used to have, you know, 100 people and now it, you're lucky to get 20 people there, should you rethink that? Um, again, those are very difficult decisions to make. And maybe it's just reinventing your club. You know, um, I'm not really pushing this single emphasis club, but I think it's going to save a lot of clubs that don't have a, uh, a true emphasis in their community, a true mission, um, and they're going, they can find one thing that they can do and rally around for the entire year just on that topic. Um, there are hard discussions to have with club members, especially when club members have uh, been there um, for years. Um, but I think that also people will appreciate when someone steps up and says, hey, I really think that something needs to change. Um, and there may be some, some hard feelings, some hurt hearts um, for a while, um, but things will get better. Excellent. Well, our last question has several questions. Um, so thank you for the person who submitted this one. Um, and I'll let you, you know, segue into any closing remarks you might have after this 
Um, can you tell us more about your workshop about a speaker not showing up? We had a few of those during the pandemic. What can we do when a speaker bails on a virtual meeting? How do we put our best face forward if we have prospective members at that meeting? And will you come back and present that for us? <laughs> Um, that's actually one of my favorite workshops to do because it has a lot of a lot of great ideas. You know, I really haven't thought thought about the whole virtual thing of uh, a speaker bailing, um, ex except to have you know Plan B. But when we were in um, you know pre-pandemic mode, you know, I I had every club president thinking, you need a service project in the car ready to go, and I did, and. Um, I didn't use it until it was like almost the last month of my um, club presidency, but I had gone and I had purchased like, um, you know, 25 white pillowcases and fabric markers, and I was prepared. Whenever we did not have a speaker, we were going to make pillowcases for the local children's hospital. Um, you know, having a service project, having something, a discussion topic, um, or again, um, having someone who just has a very unusual topic that you can tap, you know, pretty quick and say, hey, can you talk about this? Um, I think that that, that is, is important. I, I went through a whole um, series of, of meetings in one of my clubs where you would show up and the speaker didn't show up um, or no one got a speaker for that meeting. So it was like a 10 minute uh, Qantas meeting. And then you're thinking, oh, I drove 15 minutes here for a 10 minute Qantas club and I'm driving 15 minutes back. Um, so, you know, that is, that is so important that you do have, um, uh, that you try not to cancel every time that a speaker cancels, that you have something that is productive um, and um, that, that people can be engaged in. I think that's a great place to leave it. Chris, do you have any parting words or thoughts you'd like to share with New England and Bermuda? Uh, not really. This has been like so much fun. Uh, again, seeing all the, the familiar faces uh, again. Um, I enjoy uh, talking about Kiwanis. Um, you know, I enjoy my job as the director of um, membership and education. Um, you know, I will, I'll leave you with this. I think that others look at Kiwanis clubs and think, wow, that Kiwanis club is perfect. They do all the right things. There is no perfect Kiwanis club out there. Every Kiwanis club has issues, um, whether they're internal or external issues. Every Kiwanis club has something that they want to improve upon. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's human nature to look at another club and say, oh, they've got it all together. Um, and, you know, sometimes you look at those clubs that might be a hundred members and um, they're not doing as much as maybe a club that has 25 members or a club that has 15 members uh, who's really known well in, in the community. So every club has something that they can improve upon. So again, um, Brian, thank you for the invitation. Um, really glad that uh, I was able to do this tonight. And again, great to see all of you from um, New England and Bermuda. Well, thank you so much, Chris. I know you have a super busy schedule, so we appreciate you taking the time out to spend the evening with us. Um, I invite you all to please join me in a big round of applause for Chris from wherever you're joining us across the district. So as we wrap up, please remember to type your name and your club in the chat if you haven't already so we can take attendance. And I myself forgot, so there we go. Uh, we've all got that out there now. Um, a reminder to club secretaries, after you hold your annual meeting this spring, be sure to order your free printed copies of the Kiwanis Leadership Guide. We are taking orders via an online form that Elise will drop in the chat and a reminder that only the clubs who submit an order will receive copies this year. So secretaries and presidents, you should have received an email or two with the details as well as follow up from your Lieutenant Governor. But if you haven't yet, secretaries, please click that link and submit your order for your club. 
A reminder that annual meetings must be held by May 15th, and so that's also the deadline for our order for the leadership guidance. Um, I hope you all saw the email last week announcing all of our workshops for this month, and you probably did because you're here with us tonight, um, but we're going to go over the schedule for what we have coming up the rest of this month. So Elise, if you wouldn't mind pulling up your screen for us. So we have three more workshops coming up for our membership month. Uh, next week on May 12th, we have our governor-elect Gayla Bartlett, who's presenting Marketing Your Club to Recruit Members. And Gayla is going to pro provide st strategies for effectively promoting your club in order to attract prospective members. So make sure you join us for that. The following week, we will have a panel discussion with millennial Kiwanians about why they joined Kiwanis and what they look for in a Kiwanis club which will hopefully give you some tips and ideas if you're looking to recruit millennials to your Kiwanis Club. And on May 6, we will end the month with a session about planning a new member orientation. Because remember, when you recruit a new member, the work doesn't end once you sign them up and when you get them in and induct them. You have to continue that by making sure they're educated and they know what to expect from their Kiwanis experience. So. Elise and I will be presenting that session and talking about how you can properly orient and introduce your new members to Kiwanis. Remember to sign up for these free workshops and encourage your fellow club members to do the same. You can find more information anywhere you search for New England in Bermuda. You can find it on our website, on our Facebook page, in our district Facebook group, and also in your inbox. We have a playlist on YouTube if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, where you can watch the recordings from most of our past workshops as well as other workshops we've presented over the last year. To access any of the resources from our past workshops, you can take a look at your confirmation email that you received today. Just click on the virtual workshop materials link at the bottom of your email and that will take you to a Google Drive of resources. And Elise has also dropped that link in the chat for you. I would like to extend a big thank you once again to our district education committee members. We have Elise DeNorfia, Judy Barrett, and David Griffin, who are helping behind the scenes to make these weekly workshops a success. So please join me in a round of applause for our committee. And with that, a big thank you again to Chris Martz from Kiwanis International for joining us tonight, and to each of you for joining us in participating in this workshop series. Uh, we had a lot of ideas tonight, and I really hope you leave with uh, an idea or two that you can implement to improve your own club's culture and hopefully ignite some membership recruitment. So have a wonderful night. Please be safe and be well, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Take care. Wonderful program. Wonderful. Doing a good job, Chris. All the way from Bermuda. <laughs>